Our pace of living leaves us little time for leisure. Our program will give you a chance to experience the fascinating world of traveling, extreme adventures, hunting and fishing. Each week we will take you to the most beautiful places of Kazakhstan. Kazakhstani hunters slowly but surely are joining the world community of trophy hunters. Today, trophy hunting is a popular kind of sport with billions of dollars in the budget and a sport that has millions of followers uniting thousands of clubs and wildlife protecting and scientific organizations as well as specialist journals and TV broadcast companies, international projects that finance the protection of wild animals in different parts of the world. Social and language barriers didn't allow Kazakhstani hunters to integrate into this process. But we keep up with the time, and now Kazakhstani hunters appear on the pages of elite hunting magazines with great trophies that they have got in the most exotic countries of the world. In the first part of the last century, hunters used to hunt just to satisfy their basic needs and for fun. Even the great Hemingway thought that wild animals are God's gift to us and shot hundreds of them without thinking if he needed that number of trophies. However, in the second part of the 20th century, hunters noticed that the amount of game was in decline everywhere, and had they continued hunting in this way, soon there wouldn't have been any game left. Soon, the motto, the honest hunter pays, became popular and widespread. Specially trained people started to manage game reserves at the expense of the fees paid by hunters. And this system proved to be effective. Why trophy hunters? The answer is simple. Hunters shoot one old male species that has already lost its reproductive ability, and this trophy is paid hundreds and sometimes thousands of times more than the animal's meat, skin and horns. This added cost motivates local people to value such an expensive resource. Trophy hunters developed sports rules. The violation of these rules and principles means the loss of the hunter's reputation and exclusion from the hunting society. The main idea behind these rules is fair chasing. The trophy hunter deliberately minimizes his chances to get the game and refuses to use the means of modern technology, so that the hunt becomes a fair competition, not slaughtering wild animals. This culture is spreading in the community of Kazakhstani trophy hunters as well. International relations are developing and Kazakhstani hunters not only receive foreign trophy hunters, but also themselves travel to different parts of the world and prove they are decent competitors in the world trophy hunting community. We have only a few world-class trophy hunters, but we have more of them from year to year. For example, recently well-known Kazakhstani hunter and blogger Ali Aliyev was the center of attention on trophy hunting blogs with such trophies as the Nelk and the huge Kamchatka bear. We accompanied him on that trip. We fly to Petropavl through Novosibirsk and Khabarovsk. The charter flight takes 18 hours. Petropavl creates an impression we have traveled 20 years back to the past. At the airport, we are met by organizer of the tour, Sergei Tchutchev. By the way, Sergei is a direct descendant of Russian poet Fyodor Tuchev. The way from Petropavl to the Milkova Regional Center takes five hours, although we spend one hour of these five bathing in hot springs. On the bank of the cold mountain river bubble up hot springs, with the water temperature being 50 degrees centigrade. On the left from the road, we can see snow caps of the Middle Ridge mountain chain and the bright colors of the Kamchatka taiga. At the 200th kilometer, the road pavement finishes and the next 100 kilometers are covered by us on the road full of holes and bumps, which gives our car a hard time. Having passed the Milkova settlement, we turned into a narrow road into the taiga and soon we reach the bank of the Kamchatka River, where we are met by local hunters in inflated boats, Zhenya, Sasha and Uncle Kolya. We have to reach the camp in a daylight time, as when it gets dark, it is very dangerous to travel in boats. We may bump into a log or a sharp stone and damage the boat. The river part of the journey takes about two hours. 
our boat is floating, collecting some water on the boat bottom and making its way through the river waste very slowly towards the sea along the river Kamchatka. Why did I say yes to this trip? I'm speechless. On the way to our destination, we learn a lot of useful information. First, the main flow of fish migration is over now. Second, our chances to hunt for the elk in this area are minimal. As at this time of the year, the elk is mostly in the taiga, and hunters from the city are not used to rambling in the thick woodland, let alone the hunters from Kazakhstan. The field camp near the Kamchatka River consists of several tents, mobile kitchen and banyar. The mobile banyar in the taiga is a very important facility in such trips. Ali has substantial experience hunting for the bear in the mountain part of Kazakhstani, Altai and Saul. We hunt for bears in those areas every year. In the eastern region of Kazakhstan we have elks too, although they are not as large as the Kamchatka species. In the Kazakhstani mountains, we usually travel on horses and walk and creep only when we notice the hunted animal on steep slopes where the horse is not capable of going. All the necessary stuff that will help us survive on the trip is in travel bags called Karjun. If the weather is bad, it is always possible to set a mobile camp, get waterproof clothing and cook a meal. However, here in Kamchatka, things are completely different. We cannot use horses, and all the equipment and stuff we need can only be carried on our shoulders. Unfortunately, this makes us select our burden. In addition, we have filming equipment, so we have to leave a lot of useful things in the camp. This is our first raid. We see a few traces of the elk and a large number of bear traces. We have covered only about 9 kilometers walking through the taiga, according to the GPS navigator. But the taiga has exhausted us and we decide to make a break from hunting and try to catch fish. In the Kamchatka river there are several species of river fish, such as Kumja, Malma, Mikisha, Harius and other species that go up the river with other six kinds of salmon to spawn during the season. What a fish! Harius bites worms well but it is better to catch larger species using spoon baits for sports fishing. It is easier to catch harius using the spoon bait here in Kamchatka, unlike in other regions of the Russian Federation. From mid-June, the following fishes migrate – humpback salmon, chinook salmon, sokea salmon and Russian salmon. From the midsummer, coho salmon starts migrating and goes on until the river water freezes. In the autumn, it is the turn of Russian salmon again, but this fish doesn't bite the spoon bait. So, in September, we can catch coho salmon, harius, brown trout, salvelinus and rainbow trout. Kamchatki practically all navigation is the river Kamchatka is abundant with various kinds of fish a year round. In June and July there's humpback salmon, Russian salmon, Chinook salmon and Nelma. In August coho salmon comes to spawn here. It keeps spawning here until the river is covered with ice. Apart from this, there are local species such as Harius, Salvelinus, brown trout and Myakisha, which is a kind of Kamchatka trout. It weighs from 4 to 5 kilograms. We heard it's a tasty fish, but we haven't caught anything yet. We use small rotating spoon baits of light colors. From about 11 a.m. coho salmon starts to bite our baits. Then we have no fish until 4 p.m. But later, fish bites the baits actively again. We try to manage the tackles to a fishing rod with a float and with a worm as a bait. Very soon, we catch several dozens of harius fishes. There is no doubt that this fish bites worms much better than spoon baits. The sun-dried harius is finger licking. Uncle Kole cooks a five-minute meal from coho salmon eggs. First he cooks to zuluk. He adds some salt into boiling water. The caviar is put through a special sieve. It is then put into the salty water. Then the eggs are filtered through a piece of gauze and the delicatessen is ready. We succeed in fishing. We have a feeling that we can catch large fish just throwing the fishing line into the water and fish will bite the bait with ease.
but hunting is a lot more difficult than fishing. On the first few days in Kamchatka, we tried to approach the elk in the taiga, but failed to do it. In our home country, when hunting in the mountains, we've got used to spotting the animal through binoculars at a large distance. But here in Taiga, the visibility is hardly ever more than 100 meters. Elks have an excellent sense of hearing and will hear the hunter's steps long before he will approach the animal at a visible distance. We have two options, tiring the animal out or the classical hunt imitating elk bellowing. At the end of September, elk's mating season starts. It is possible to attract a main species imitating the sounds of bellowing of the male elk that the animals use for calling the male rival. To us humans, it sounds like moaning. Sergei gives us a simple handmade device for imitating elk bellowing called Vaba, made from an old tin can. If you put a little wet rope through the hole in the can bottom and stretch it stroking it between two fingers, it starts vibrating. The can and the strength of stretching make an effect on the sound produced. In order to imitate the elk well, we have to try hard and exercise a lot. We try to chase the animal for a couple of times to tire it out. Once, a female elk runs out of the forest. And at the second time, we see a young male showing up from bushes. But what we really want is a decent trophy. Then, Sergei informs us on the portable radio that he has seen a large elk behind the hill. Our attempts to find the elk now turn to a real hunt. We have identified the location of the trophy and now we need to decide on what tactic we will use. Tiring the animal out doesn't seem to be a good choice as there are few of us and the thick taiga will allow the animal to escape easily. Ali decides to hunt for the animal at the path and he banks on his ability to imitate the mating elk bellowing and his luck. On day 6 of the hunt, since the early morning it has been drizzling. By the noon, from the eastern ridge of the mount, we see waves of thick fog. From time to time, you can vaguely see the features of the landscape through the fog. There was absolute silence. We could hear no rustle. Only magpies responded to the bellowing. Ali tried to imitate using the old can. After every 20 minutes, he produces a series of sounds using his instrument. Several hours pass and Ali has no reaction. Suddenly, Ali hears a noise that sounds like metal chain crash. But later, he realizes this is the elk. The animal responds to Ali's imitated sounds. In a few minutes, Ali hears the animal beating its antlers against a tree and he hears its bellowing. The elk comes to the edge of the forest clearing and stays still. It isn't willing to show up in the open space. The hunter tries not to move under the disguise of thick and high vegetation. Ali feels the presence of the elk, but cannot see it. He leans with his rifle against willow twigs and gazes at the thick forest, trying to recognize the features of the animal among numerous tree branches. Suddenly, the elk emits the low sound. Now the hunter knows for sure where the animal is. He spots the silhouette of the animal with its huge antlers. Ali's shot is accurate. Yes, there it is! We've made it, Max! Superb! We've made it! <laughs> Getting the trophy from the wood takes the whole following day. While skinning the animal, Ali accidentally makes a cut on his hand. It doesn't bleed much, but the cut is deep. The hunter uses a first aid kit that every hunter should have. Next morning, he sees that the hand has got swollen, despite medication he used recently. And one more adventure awaits us, hunting for the Kamchatka bear. We will tell you about it on the next edition of the program.